It's going to make you a bit uncomfortable. When I was 16 years old, I was very ambitious. And I, I'm from the McDonald's generation. We want everything so fast. We want to be on social media. We want everybody to like us on Instagram. We want to be on Twitter. We want to just do everything so quick. I was working every hour under the sun. And I said, I can't do this anymore. And I started hanging around with people that you shouldn't really hang around with. And I fell on the wayside. <laughs> Married, and whatever I put my name on, I must respect. I must have the most respect for myself. I'm gonna raise myself first. Guys, we're literally getting spoiled today. Yeah, you look so pretty though. Guys, look how stylish she is. She's got money, she's got businesses, she is a boss, and I wanna be that. Do you know that's not even her real name? Do you know her background? The first time I went to prison, I was 14 years old. The second time I went to prison, I was 17 years old. The third time I went to prison, I think I was 19. This woman is a scammer, and you're all falling for it. Guess what, guys? Hear me. I did the crime, I paid the time, and I paid every penny back. No, you didn't. Living with Mariam is like, your best dream and your worst nightmare. You don't even realize, like, all the crazy things you do for her if skills of manipulation aren't the biggest sign of a cult leader, then I do not know what is. This is a story about a person who loves Balenciaga, Fendi and flexing on social media. But most of all, she loves other people's money. Um, it's like a selfie video. She's just showing off, really. She's just walking with her big Louis Vuitton bag and nice long coat. <laughs> It's not even a heart sinking feeling, it's more a case of like, so this is what you use the people's money to do. I knew of her from college and she always appeared to me as someone who was like super friendly and got on with everyone sort of thing. We knew her as Mariam. I do believe I remember her being called Cindy as well. I don't remember exactly when we became friends on Facebook. I must have posted a status that reflected that I was obviously in a bad place or something. And she reached out to me um, via a message and we got talking. Um, she was really just giving me words of encouragement and so on. It wasn't hard because I'm also quite, <laughs> I trust people quite easily. Shamina shared with Mariam that her grandmother had just a few months to live and that she and her mum were flying out to Jamaica to see her. And at that point, she said, oh, has your, have you pay, purchased your tickets yet? Um, and I said, I'm not really sure my mum's paying uh, this time. And she was like, oh, no, 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 just, no, if you haven't booked yet, please tell your mum that I can get discount. She was like, my work allows me a privilege or benefits of getting discounted airline tickets, etc." And basically, we had to transfer the money to her and she would uh, purchase the tickets or the flights, whatever. She did sort of deal with it as a matter of urgency. Oh, babe, I don't need to lose this ticket, you know? So you don't even get a chance to really have a second thought. Shamina's mum sent Mariam almost 2,000 pounds and they waited for the plane tickets to arrive and waited. I just remember my heart sinking and thinking, no way, she couldn't do this. Not to me and not considering the conversation that we'd had. And I was on the phone and I remember speaking very slowly, very clearly, and I said, Mariam, if you have done what I think you've done, please let me not catch you out in these streets. <laughs> And then she switched off her phone and there was never any more contact. 
I set out to expose her, and then I started getting messages from other people. My name is Mrs. Tamar Michelle Goff. Marion defrauded me about 77, between 77 and 100,000 pounds. It really all started around about May 2014. I received a Vodafone invoice, and it had an East London um, address on it. Uh, the invoice was addressed to my husband then, and I'm just thinking, we don't have any property in East London. And you know when you like the wife, you just know something's not quite right. I just knew then. And then I saw this Marion Bula at this address, and I decided to go ahead and uh, make my appearance at that address. I had taken a train from uh, Essex down to Liverpool Street jumped into a black taxi. Even the taxi driver didn't even know. I mean, we were lost for like an hour. It was like somewhere like in the Docklands. I don't know, I just had a bad feeling when I uh, arrived at that property. And this woman answered the door, and I knew then that wasn't, it wasn't Mariam, because this woman was like my age, and I said, you know, it's, I need to speak to Miss Mbula. And she lied and said that she was Miss Mbula, Mary Mbula. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> there was words exchanged, and she pretty much confirmed that that was Mary's address. It, it just didn't feel right. Something just, just didn't feel right. Tamara was at the right address, but Mariam wasn't home. Later, she discovered that her husband had transferred money from their joint account to Mariam. So at that point, this issue was between myself and my husband. And then, you know, I was going to deal with him, but I was going to get her later. So I started, like, researching through company's house. I even went as far as ordering reports and started pricing a dossier on Miss Mbula to actually unravel her game. You have to get all the information, kind of lay it all out, take a notepad, look at dates, look at the names, the discrepancies. She would sometimes switch her name around to Napapa Mbula, not just Mariam. I put in a thread, you know, have you ever been a victim of Mary Napapa Mbula? And I, put, I was under the name of Claire Reynolds. And uh, you would not believe how many people pretty much uh, reached out to me that they had been frauded and all those sort of uh, unfortunate dealings with Marion. It started off with Shamit and I, and then all of a sudden it was like 10, 12 of us. And then it just started growing. Well, Tamara reached out to me her story really shocked me. I think that's when I realised how advanced Mariam had become in her schemes and, you know, scams. You know, I was on a mission. I kept an eye on Mariam for about two years. While researching online, Tamara found an article in an Italian newspaper. Let's see here. Right. The Italian article. In April 2011, plainclothes police in Milan followed the movements of five girls aged between 22 and 25 years. The ringleader, 23-year-old Napapan Mbula. They were armed with cloned credit cards and were targeting luxury boutiques. Mariam attempted to make off with an 8,000 euro Rolex, Dior shoes, Dior glasses, a Gucci watch. She also had eight American Express cards in person. Mariam had assembled a bling ring of fraudsters who used cloned credit cards to buy luxury goods from boutiques across Europe. Eventually, she wound up in prison, first in Belgium, then in Spain. That's where she met Ellie's mum. Mary 
Mariam was in prison as a prisoner with my mom. Mariam was actually due to be released, but she um, was bilingual, so she was able to actually translate for my mom from, from English to Spanish and vice versa. Ellie had been left caring for her severely disabled sister and younger siblings back in the UK. With Mariam's help, her mum was trying to arrange bail so she could come back home. She was lovely. She was so sweet to her, and she, she offered to help. Mariam encouraged her to be as transparent as possible and give as much detail as possible to ensure that she could hopefully get the best possible bail hearing. And so my mum had you know, given up all this information about us, you know, our names, our, our ages. A few days later, Ellie got a call. She was like, hello, my name is um, Charlene. I'm calling from the British Embassy in Spain and your mum's got bail and, and I'm, I'm so pleased to tell you that your mum's going to be coming home um, if we can get this money. Th this was the, you know, this was the ultimatum. It's either you get the money and she comes home or you don't and she doesn't. Ellie was told that bail was set at £10,000. And I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I'm like, are, are you serious? My, my mum is coming home. Are you, is this what you're telling me? And she's like, yeah. You know, she sounded so happy for me. You know, we were ready for her to come home. And then 5 o'clock the next morning, I got a call. It was Charlene. To secure bail, Ellie needed to pay another £5,600 immediately. Without any hesitation, I'd called around and managed to get that. I think the banks opened at, like, 9 a.m. I was there, and I'd, I'd sent it off again. Later, there was a final text message from Charlene at the British consulate. The Apple ID came up as Mariam Dynasty. So I just kind of responded, saying, like, who's, who's Mariam? And I never heard from her again. I didn't get a response, and this was, I'd already given the money. And I instantly got this, like, knot in my stomach, basically telling me something's wrong here. And I thought, now I need to tell my family that I've messed up. Alone and with no money, Ellie and her family were evicted from their home. There were days where I was having to look under sofas for pennies just to be able to go and buy pasta. And she, she put me in a state of depression that I didn't think I'd ever get out of. Before long, Marion was out of prison and back in London. She had a new business venture, a luxury shoe hire boutique in London's Westfield shopping centre. I started this crazy idea of renting shoes. Everybody was against me. Everybody was saying, oh my God, who's going to wear it? Da, 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 da. All I did was literally take all of my sister's shoes, all of my shoes, my mom's shoes, friend's shoes. I gathered like 150 or 200 pairs of designer shoes. I made a lot of money um, and I was 24. I had no, guys, I had no idea what I was doing. Sending shoes, from my understanding, um, that my ex-husband and I funded was a luxury shoe hire. So she would have the Bhutans, Jimmy Choo's, Gucci, where you go and hire these shoes for occasions. I started to like comment under uh, this Cindy shoes, I think it was at the time, because people were praising her. Oh, look at what she's done. This is such a great business and what have you under the post. And I think the more I read it, the more furious I became because I just thought, this woman is a scammer and you're all falling for it. It was definitely a front for her to collect money and the people are not getting the products. Tamara and Shamina collected the allegations and took them to the police. I was contacted by uh, a detective of the Metropolitan Police. I think it was the uh, Frauds Department. And he said they received my report. It was very damning. We made a lot of money. Um, it was really good. I had challenges of fulfilling orders. Just Everything was happening. I woke up one morning and I was arrested that morning and then I went to jail and that was kind of it. She had been arrested. At the time, it was 20 counts. You know, don't worry about Miss Simbula because she would be in cell block D over Christmas. In May 2015, Marion pleaded guilty to five counts of fraud 
she was 26 and for the fifth time in her life, she was going to prison. And while awaiting trial, she'd also become pregnant. Every girl's dream, yeah, when you're pregnant is to have this beautiful birth. I didn't have that choice. That, that was taken away from you. I could even go as far as saying I took that away from myself. I'm going to myself and I'm thinking, the f am I doing? What is going on with my life? Getting sent to prison while pregnant may sound like a disaster. Mariam turned it into an opportunity. Marion, your story is incredible. If we may, we'll go back to when you were 18. You got in with the, the wrong guy, really, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, was in a bad relationship at that time, and um, the person I was with um, committed some fraud. And um, because I was involved in that crowd, I was later sentenced um, to quite a heavy prison sentence um, when expecting my first baby. I'm sitting here looking at this, this woman child and I'm watching this clip, and I'm just thinking, you are very brazen, you know? And um, first of all, it's not your name. She was going by Mola? That frustrated me. That's not even her real name. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's had a, a baby in prison. And I said, but the story that she's giving out about her, her boyfriend or whatever making her do, I said, that's not even it. My life had changed so much. You know, I'd made some massive improvements in my life, and I didn't think that um, the judge would be so so harsh. How are you going to go on television like that? I expect no one's not going to say anything. This must be something seriously wrong with you. You think that you are above the law and not going to get caught? I think it was Tamara who sent me the link, and my blood was boiling. And I was like, that's not the story. She twisted the truth and created a whole new narrative to make herself look like someone who used to be bad and has come out the other end and just wants to help people. So I thought about what I could do for women, all types of women, not just people that have been involved in the criminal justice system, but any woman who's interested in turning her life around, setting up a business, what could I do to help her? Um, so I set up Mental Matcher, which is an initiative that kind of connects um, more senior women um, in business to become mentors to women like me. Uh, what's so incredible is you went straight out there and you said, uh, Amanda Wakely, will you do it? She said yes, and everybody you've asked, nobody's said no, have they? I haven't had a no. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you for so coming on the show. My name is Emma Wilson, and I met Mariam in around 2015, 2016. My first impressions were, yeah, I was really impressed. She was a go-getter, you know, she'd come out of prison, she owned her story, and we just went out for various dinners and breakfasts at, you know, in Mayfair, went for dinner. She's on these big programs, so you just assume that she told the story and that's the story. Because if you're gonna come out, why, why lie about it? She'd bring her events on a really high-class basis with all the right people. It would be places like Bulgari Hotel, the Condé Nast. It'd be the Vogue Cafe, where she had like different events. Today we're celebrating 100 women in business. Um, since launching in March 2016, we've connected 100 women to mentors and mentees. Always glamorous. She's always in designer brands from the start. From when I met her, it was very much very sleek. It, I guess we had a similar sense of what we liked in terms of, you know, she was very professional. You'd always be gift bags at her events. Branding was important. The attendees were on point, the panel was on point. Everything was, you know, that high, that high class, organized well sort of thing. So many people ask me, why do you do what you do? Why are you running an initiative? Emma and Mariam decided to go into business together. And then she'd call me and she'd be like, oh, I've got this idea. We met for dinners and lunches and breakfasts and quite a few times and really went through this idea and worked it out, put it on paper. And then it was like, okay, Emma, if you're serious, we need to do this idea we're gonna need this much money. Demands came thick and fast for marketing, product design, and photo shoots. And it's always this urgency that she puts you in the whirlwind. You know, they need it today because this is gonna happen. 
um, if we don't do it, we're going to lose out, we're going to lose that money and we really need to get it moving and things like that. So the time that I gave her money was literally only over a few, a few months. So I didn't know about the, all the convictions she's had outside of the UK. Word was beginning to get round that mental matchup wasn't what Mariam claimed it to be. My sister spoke to me and was like, what are you doing working with this person? And I was like, oh. at this point, I, I know she's right, but I'm already too far in. So what do you do? You know, how am I going to get my money back and everything else? By this time, Emma had given Mariam thousands. After other victims of Mariam's mental matcher scheme complained to the authorities, she was exposed by the Daily Telegraph. She responded by going quiet. I don't understand why the uh, law enforcement have not been able to tackle this and completely um, close in. Um, it's a shame that she keeps getting away with it, but I. I have learned her pattern, you know. She seems to know how to go underground, let things cool off, and she resurfaces again. Five, four, three, two, one. back, not as a business leader, but as a senior pastor in a church called SPAC Nation, which preaches the prosperity gospel, where good deeds are rewarded with wealth. The first time I went to prison, I was 14 years old. The second time I went to prison, I was 17 years old. The third time I went to prison, I think I was 19. I don't, to be sincere, I don't remember much of my childhood because I spent a lot of that time in jail. Then I thought, God, I want to change my life. My name is Sarah, and Maria made me take out a 5K loan, which I'm still trying to pay back today. The first time I met Mariam was around three weeks after I started at SPAC Nation. I was like, oh my God, like, this woman is so wow that like, she's wow <laughs> she's everything like she's got everything i want she's living the life that i want she's got money she's got businesses she is a boss and i want to be that so when people started calling me mini mariam i was like oh my god yes like that's me <laughs> Um, I was, I loved it, I can't lie, I loved it up until it, it went bad, you know what I mean? But I loved it up until then. <laughs> By the time Sarah left SPAC Nation, it caught the attention of the police and the media. Tonight on Panorama, we investigate the church facing allegations of fraud. <laughs> this is Marion Mola. She has a string of fraud convictions yet still run a house for young women. Mariam's house was supposed to be a safe place for vulnerable young churchgoers. Hi, guys. Welcome to Love House. My name's Mariam, and we have, like, eight people that live here. Come quickly, let me show you. But it wasn't long before she was asking them for money. I said to my girls this morning, I don't know what you think is happening in this house. I tell you what to do with your finances. I tell you where you're going. It's not like you have an option. A house of order is a house that will prosper. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I haven't even watched the whole thing and I already know what Periscope this is. And when they ran out of money, Mariam urged Sarah and others to take out loans of up to £5,000 and give the money to her. There are still people that haven't taken out, let me tell you the truth, there are still people that haven't taken out loans yet and I'm gonna go and find them, I don't care what you say, I'm gonna go and crush them. Why? Because they are there, they're looking, they want to, but they just can't hear me yet. That was her whole agenda, finding people with good credit or finding people who haven't taken out loans before and just doing whatever she can 
to completely destroy it and to just squeeze as much as she can out of them. Mariam would have, like, large sums of money in her room um, at a time, and she would hide it quite well. But it was always, like, really big wads of cash. Like, I'm so sure, like, it was up to, like, at least, like, 10K or something. It was a lot of money. Mariam had cash, but Sarah, like so many others in SPAC Nation, only had debts. I was so stressed out and I was so angry at Mariam because she promised me that she was going to keep up with the payments. And she has this whole, like, persona of wealth. Like, I just have money to spare. Do you know what I mean? And you can't make £213.88 a month. Mariam was so nonchalant about the whole situation. I think that's what really irked me even more because it was like, I'm here panicking. I'm about to be sent to court on my birthday and you're off to Selfridges. Mariam is part of an ongoing police investigation, but she's still at large. Living with Mariam is like, your best dream and your worst nightmare because you don't even realise, like, all the crazy things you do for her. You, you just don't see it. If anyone asked me to do half the things that Mariam would tell me to do, I'd, like, I'd probably give you the biggest, like, mug off <laughs> ever. Like, who are you asking? It's not me, I'm not the one. But I think because I was so, like, infatuated with this woman that I didn't realise that she was actually taking me for a dickhead, <laughs> big time. If you think about it, for someone who spends, has all that energy to do things on the low, you would think she'd be, take that and do something on the positive. It has to be greed, nothing else I can imagine. Why are you still doing this to people? And even after uh, spending time in prison, coming out, you're still finding new ways and you're relentless. You just continue over and over again, finding new ways you will not stop. You'll find a new way to reinvent yourself and continue to take from people. She spent an entire, like over a decade, doing this to people. I've tried to get in contact with her. I've lost count of how many times over the last, I don't know, year or so. What have I heard about Mariam? That's good. That's not from her mouth. It's so hard in this day and age because you go on social media and everyone's there, like, saying how great people are and how amazing they are Is it in their comments. You know, she's got all these kind of really big labels, first person to do this, first person to do that, did this at a certain age. When someone's dishing out so much clout on social media, you expect there to be a lot more behind them. I'm happy to be the only snake. Shall make me the anaconda. You know the way an anaconda behaves, yeah? It behaves dead. It behaves dead. And it doesn't move for a long time. I'd like to have hope that I get my money back, but also hope that she kind of, I don't know, in a way disproves all this stuff, even though it's very unlikely. You know, you don't really want to paint him out to be a bad person. It slivers around. You might see it in one family, and it goes into another family, and it slivers. Maybe she will show the right side and do the right thing. And then it just eats you. It takes what it's looking for.